Welcome. I am Michelle LeClaire, Executive Director of Buckham Gallery. Today, I am chatting with Kate Snow about her exhibition, Nice Things for Nice People, on view through January 7th. This exhibition may also be viewed on our website at buckhamgallery.org. Buckham Gallery is pleased to present the work of Kate Snow in her solo exhibition, Nice Things for Nice People. Snow's work are silly, irrelevant, absurd. Squares and dots become characters in their own world. They move and interact, making friends, getting lost, or just existing in their own little simple selves. Before we join the conversation, I would like to say thank you to our incredible audience, whether visiting the gallery in person or viewing these videos online, and to all the artists who submit to our exhibition calls, I appreciate you. Next, I would like to say a big thank you to the individuals and organizations who support Buckham Fine Arts Project and Gallery, including the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, Michigan Arts and Culture Council, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Greater Flint Arts Council Share Art, Genesee Grant Program made possible by the Genesee County Arts Education and Cultural Enrichment Funds. Your tax dollars at work. Thank you. Kate Snow is a painter and printmaker in Cleveland, Ohio. She began exhibiting in 2015 and the work has since been shown across the United States and in Germany. Her work is included in a number of private and public collections, including Baker Holster, Metro Health Hospitals, and Weston Hotels. She has been awarded residencies in Dresden, Germany, Brush Creek Foundation for the Arts of Saratoga, Wyoming, the studios of Key West in Key West, Florida, and the Gentile Foundation in Banner, Wyoming. In 2018, Kate was commissioned by the Cleveland International Film Festival to design and create the Filmmaker Awards this season. Not season, excuse me. Uh, most recently, she was a recipient of the 2021 Ohio Arts Council Individual Excellence Award from the state of Ohio. Welcome, Kate. I absolutely love your paintings and I have been really looking forward to have this opportunity to talk with you and, and learn more about um, you and your process of working. <laughs> so wonderful. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so I like to start these conversations, um, you know, to learn a little bit more about your background, you know, like where you're from and sort of what led you to the art making path. I have, this question is always so hard for me because I don't have a straight trajectory to, you know, from, from kindergarten to now. I um, was always a maker. I always loved making things. I always liked making art as a kid. But I never, uh, I didn't take any art classes in high school. I was not part of the kind of art crowd. Um, and I think a lot of it was I just felt really intimidated. I didn't think I was good enough to do it. I, uh, the way that I worked was very different. I had a hard time kind of pulling back and learning a lot of the um, basic art foundational things because I would get so honed in on something and, and work on something very detailed. And I just was not able to produce the work that I thought I needed to produce in the classes. My work didn't look like other people's work. So I just backed off entirely and I didn't really make any art at all. Um, and then in my twenties, I started taking some art classes at community college. So I started, my first one was a photography class because I'd always wanted to learn photography. And from there, I started getting into the foundational things, um, you know, uh, fundamentals of drawing, color theory, that kind of thing. And so I did all of those classes just through community college, kind of one mm -hmm. at a time as I, you know, took one class and the teacher said, you know, you really should take life drawing. And I took life drawing and they said, you really should take. So I tried a lot of different things. And then I ended up at a, a maker space, a printmaking studio mm -hmm. that um, had, it was a cooperative uh, studio. It had, I don't know, maybe 20 artist members and then classes and residencies. And so I got involved with them. And that's really when uh, my education kind of took off. That was, we had artists coming in from all over the world, Taipei, Berlin, and I would just sort of creep up behind them and look over their shoulder and ask a bunch <laughs> of questions. And artists are incredibly generous with their knowledge and idea sharing. And that was a game changer for me. 
And that was really when I started developing my own voice. How do I work? What do I want to say? What's working and what isn't working? And it was great to be in that environment because not only was I learning how other people were doing it, I was also finding out how people were reacting to my work, um, oh. what they were seeing. Because, you know, when you're an artist, it can be very isolating. You're working by yourself a lot. And you go through the sort of like, this is amazing. Oh, I should burn it. This is great. This is terrible. <laughs> and having other people look at your work and say, yeah, I'm, I'm picking up what you're throwing down. I, I get it was so helpful. And it really helped me kind of hone where I was going. So I don't have a sort of like, and then I went to art school and then I went to graduate school. It's this kind of winding path that got me where I am now. But I'm so grateful to so many artists who just were um, kind in yeah. their uh, their direction giving along my journey. Yeah, well, that's kind of interesting though, I've been in a, a print shop because that is really a social um can be a rather social environment as opposed to the isolations of the different, you know, painting studios or drawings, which, um, yeah. yeah, and printmakers are also yeah. <laughs> they're always so friendly yes. and willing to share <laughs> um, their different processes and things. Well, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So do you do a lot of printmaking still or? That's, I do some, I mean, that was really, I mean, I say that printmaking is my background because that was really my education. And so it is informed a lot of how I paint comes from this background of printmaking. All of my work is very, very flat. It's very layered. Um, all of that is intentional. Um, and uh, so, so I did a lot of printmaking and then sort of kind of hybrid did some, these pieces kind of use both a little bit of printmaking, a little bit of painting. Mm -hmm. um, but I have arthritis and it started to get harder and harder to carve and, and do things like that. And I actually had um, two letterpress at a Chandler Price and a um, Heidelberg in my house. So I had about wow. 5,000 pounds of printmaking <laughs> equipment in my studio. Um, for a while, which was which was kind of wild. It was fun, but it got too hard for me to set type and things like that. So I've been doing more painting and less printmaking um, since then, but I do love it. There's something about print that is just unlike anything else. And, and it's nice because I can still use some of it in my painting. Um, so I, I get to do some of it still. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's awesome. And there's litter presses in your studio. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, um, I'm gonna bring up the slide. All right. <laughs> um, so I absolutely love your title. Nice things for nice people. <laughs> I, I, it's so great and heartwarming. Um, and so I thought maybe could you tell us how this title um, relates to this body of work? Yeah. So this, I mean, I think I talk about it a little bit in my artist statement. I started this work and, you know, this work is an evolution, right? I mean, there were, there were hints of this work that appeared early on and kind of took a few years before it evolved into this. But as I was coming up with this concept, it was around 2019 and I started to, to develop this work. And as we got toward 2020 and just the entire world shifted, everything kind of changed. Um, I, I, I leaned into the simplicity of this world. This work was sort of a space that was uncomplicated. It was um, not angry. It wasn't violent. It was happy and um, content. And it was a space that I wanted to be in, especially post 2020, when there was just so much unrest and so much fear and anger and illness. And um, I just wanted to create a nice space that people could walk into and for a minute, take a breath 
and just kind of detach a little bit from the weight of everything that was going on around us, but be in a space that reminded us um, of sort of the, the nicer things of the world that we live in, of the relationships that we have, of the people we have around us. And so that's really where that came from. Just, I wanted nice things for nice people. I wanted <laughs> nice people to come in and have a nice space to sit in for a minute and feel good. Yeah, oh, I love it. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well, they definitely are um, enjoyable paintings, you know. Um, <laughs> well, the panels depict simplified landscapes and still lives. Um, when viewed together, a narrative starts to develop. Do you start with like a story sort of sketched out before you begin um, a series? Or do you, uh, does the story sort of develop while, while you go? The story definitely develops. And this is, you know, I wish I had a less cheesy answer, but the truth is it really feels to me like a collaboration with the materials. Mm. Um, the way that these, and this is true for all of my work, but with these pieces in particular, the way that they are built is sort of layer by layer, there's a negotiation. So I start with the wood panels and um, the first layer is the stain. And that mm -hmm. really informs everything that comes next. So based on the way that the stain sits, the, what, the, what grain it pulls up, how dark it is, whatever that looks like, that then is um, the clue for my next step, which is laying down the base layer of the landscape. And so those are um, randomized to a point. I have kind of different stencils I use because that's the printmaking ink that lays on top, that foundational mm -hmm. layer. And so with that, I kind of have different landscapes that I choose from to put down. Um, and that really is used, I, I choose those based on how best to utilize the wood grain because I, I really like mm -hmm. to use what I can from that. And then once I have the landscape laid down, that's when my conversation kind of starts with my little characters. Um, and I start deciding sort of who's gonna be in this picture and what are they gonna be doing? And, and some of that is informed just visually, where would the, where would the piece feel balanced? Um, that kind of thing, just like visual element of design kind of questions, but it really is a collaboration. And I see all of these as characters. And as I'm filling the space, I just kind of have an instinctual uh, feel for when to stop. So you have these um, two panels with the houses pulled up, the one on the left with the two houses, um, I, I that wasn't sketched out ahead of time. I had my grain, I had the the white landscape and I put the first house in and I thought he needed a buddy. And so I put the second <laughs> house in and I thought that's that's enough. They're having a little conversation. Nobody needs to come in and crowd that. And then in the other one, I had a very different feel. You know, I put the first two in and I thought, no, they just seem a little lonely. I think we need to build a neighborhood here. And that's how that evolves. It really feels very social to me, which I, I mean, even as I'm saying that, I'm kind of like rolling my own eyes because no. it feels so... <laughs> but I just, I, I don't come with a fully formed idea. I let them talk to me and that just is how it works. Yeah. Wow. Oh my gosh. So, okay. Well, you mentioned you use a stencil. Um, because they look very like meticulously taped off is really kind of what yeah. I was imagining. Um, mm -hmm. So is, is that what you mean by your stencil or do you have a couple yeah. shapes that are just, yeah, wow. I do, I use different things. Sometimes I use tape. Sometimes I use um, uh, other things to tape off like um, shapes, uh, mm -hmm. labels, you know, if you go to like a, a you get sticker labels that would go on your envelopes or things like yeah. that. Sometimes I'll use those and I'll just, because I'm using printmaking ink, so I'm rolling it. So mm. I lay down my tape and then I roll it and then pull the, the tape up like a stencil. Yeah, oh, wow. Um, let me see if I, because I definitely imagine yeah. like with these, um, have I, the, the story. <laughs> Um, that that can develop. I mean, I, mean, I love the titles also. <laughs> Just, I was like, where did you go? I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> we were together. We were awesome. Now, where did you go? <laughs> it's so playful and fun, and um, 
<laughs> I had, but then I wonder who, who are the little, because if that's the blue dots, where, who are the white dots? I don't know. <laughs> are these other people that they weren't, that they didn't know? <laughs> I don't, <laughs> how involved in your stories are you? Because I'm getting pretty involved in that. <laughs> uh, that's, I mean, that's my hope. You know, it's really interesting because um, I've always seen them as characters, but this work really started years ago. Um, I used to do these paintings with um, on paper and they were just grit. So it'd be, you know, maybe a 22 by 30, sometimes smaller piece of paper that just had these same dots, but all just lined out in a grid. Um, and, and it would be something similar where it would all be white dots and there'd be a few blue ones or there'd be some missing or something like that. And I saw them, I mean, they were really just abstract paintings, mm -hmm. but I saw in them characters and they weren't presented that way. But as I was showing the work, more and more people started talking about them as characters. And I thought, oh, okay, other people are seeing this too. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to start working with characters then. And it became more about the relationships and less about uh, just the abstraction or just the shapes as shapes. They really became characters. And I leaned into that and started just making them more and more playful because I thought that the relationship aspect was what was so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that it really does create a story. And I liked the idea of stripping away everything you could I mean, we're really just talking about shape and color. That's it. That's all we've got here is shape and color. And yet people feel a narrative. They can, they can look at it and see themselves or see a world that, that makes some kind of sense that they can put together a story from. And that's fascinating to me. I love that yeah. with so little, we still construct stories in our heads about the things around us that are based on our experience. And these are both um, pretty direct. I mean, you know, you look at the one on the left, just us, you've got two dots. I think it's, I, most of us would sort of go, oh yeah, it's two people or two entities or whatever. Um, but it's also just two dots on a slope. It could be anything or nothing. Mm -hmm. And there's room in there for interpretation. And so I think people are, you know, some people said, oh, they, you know, slid down a, a snow hill or, mm -hmm. oh, they're climbing. Something. There's so little there that people can fill in the gaps with their own mm -hmm. experience. But there's also enough that it doesn't necessarily need anything else to tell a story. A and that duality, I just love. I absolutely love because I love hearing what people see. Um, and yeah. some, we, there's an underlying thing that we all see. There's a human experience thing that everyone kind of seems to tap into, but also our lens is so different that there are very different takes. And I just really love that about this work. It makes it very um, enjoyable for me to make. Mm -hmm. And while the titles do suggest the story a little bit, I think it would happen without them. Honestly, um, I, I appreciate it, you know, because it adds to the playfulness of it. But I think that, that the, the people would find the, the, the see themselves or see other people in the shapes also. Okay. So here we have, I don't know if you think of them as squares or cubes, but with the dots and I, and because I identified them also as having their own distinct personalities, I am curious if the cubes and the dots have personalities different from each other <laughs> in your in your mind this one is funny i um these are like it's like a it's like a both and neither situation for me for me in these the dots are the primary characters it's mm -hmm. and and again like this is sort of semi intentional nothing in my mind is fixed i don't have these as characters it's just sort of the way they play that i feel like and so um so there is a little bit of a sense that the squares are kind of props and the dots are the actual characters. But I think that there's a lot of flexibility in there because of the movement. Uh, I think that the squares are also very playful and kind of engage mm -hmm. with the other shapes. And so I think, I think they all have uh, personality. 
I think they're all little characters kind of moving around um, in this these environments. So I don't know if that answers the question. Well, yeah, but I have to say, like, and now it's a party. When I before looking at the title, I did see the the squares as being maybe um, challenges or something in conflict with with the dots, you know, in, obstacles, I guess, uh, into yeah. their world at the moment. But then with the title, and now it's a party. I was like, well, obviously, it's it's the squares party. They are together in you know before they were kind of separated and, and now they're all bunched in together I was like okay well maybe it's more with them yeah <laughs> I don't know <laughs> yes yeah it is it is and I think it's kind of like it could kind of be either or but mm. to me yeah it does it feels like they're all in there together and I think you know if you look at find me on the left it feels a little bit different right because you got the two yellow dots and and you can build a story just around that but I think even there, the squares are not necessarily just barriers. I think that they're also kind of personalities in their own way, um, just engaging in a different way. Right. Well, yeah, because they, they're stacking up and maybe to find the one lonely square over there on the other side of the dot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Who's getting found? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Um, but I have something interesting when you're talking about materials. Um, you know, you're using gouache and printmaking ink on panels for your paintings as opposed to, a, you know, straight acrylic or um, oil paint or, you know, something that you would consider traditionally on panel. What, why gouache and printmaking ink? What, what, how did you arrive? I mean, besides maybe printmaking background, but how, would you tell us <laughs> why you chose these materials? Yeah, I mean, it comes, it's, it's rooted in that printmaking background. Mm -hmm. So I really feel comfortable working with printmaking materials. I know how they behave. I know how to get them to do what I want them to do. And so part of it was just starting from a place of comfort and knowledge. Um, and so uh, experimenting with the wood stain and kind of taking advantage of the wood material that was its own thing. And then with the printmaking ink, just my experience working with the with, with the ink itself and then the masking and stenciling and that kind of thing. Um, I just, I liked the way it worked. I liked that I could get these crisp lines. Um, and most of all, I liked that it was very, very flat. And, and that is also why I chose gouache because both the, the ink and the gouache lay down very matte. So they're not shiny like an acrylic um, and they're very, very flat. So there's almost no texture to it. Uh, it almost could be like a lithograph if you pulled very far away or for, for mm -hmm. some of these that are on paper, it could almost be a lithograph. And a I liked print. that about yeah. it. Sorry? Or a screen print, actually, like a silk screen. It's, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. It has that feel to it. And I think, you know, some of that is just the aesthetic that I came to through my printmaking work um, and, and carried it through. But there was something about that. I liked the, the matte, flat presentation because I felt like it enhanced what I was trying to do with the simplicity of the... Uh, the uh, subjects, just mm -hmm. with flat shape, flat color, um, it really underscored uh, the simplicity and the um, just how the just the basic elements. And I didn't start introducing texture or reflection or any of that kind of stuff. I thought it would complicate what I was trying to do, um, and maybe even conflict with. Mm -hmm. And so these, I just found, I found the ink and the gouache work so well together and, and they don't lose their vibrancy. That was the other thing. I wanted mm -hmm. to have a really flat matte color that still had a lot of vibrancy um, because that was really important to me, especially because a lot of these, like the ones you have up, the main color is white. So mm -hmm. the yellow and blue really have a little work to do to, to pop up 
Um, and so that was how I ended up with those materials. And I just have not changed to anything else. I've tried a couple of other things that just have not worked the way that I wanted them to. Um, and so it was kind of, yeah. I came to it in kind of a weird way, experimenting with different things and that's what worked. And so that's what I've got. I have this weird kind of hybrid, <laughs> hybrid approach to this work. Yeah. Well, so the, I've only used gouache on paper. I've never used it on panel before. Do you have to mix anything with it so that it will, no, it's just straight gouache? No, or? but I, I do, I do put a fixer on top because gouache is so fragile, you know? Yeah. Um, so I do, I do seal it after I've painted everything, but otherwise, no, I just, I just use the gouache as is. Um, I keep it really thick and opaque when I'm painting. So it, you know, I get a nice consistency and it does sit on top. Um, you know, so if you ran your hand over the panel, you would feel a little bit of texture on it. Um, but not much. It really behaves well. And that's the, I think that's the thing. I love gouache. I love the way it behaves. It's very predictable. It's very mm -hmm. stable and it's very controllable. Um, and since I want it to do very specific things and I want it to do those things consistently, um, it's a material that I just love working with and um, it does what I want it to do. So it actually works very well on panel. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Um... And do you use a stencil also with like doing the 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 dots or is that it? those I just draw those I just paint by hand oh, and nice. so I kind of let them do their individual thing. They're all a little yeah. wonky in their own way. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness! Um, awesome, thank you. So the titles of your paintings can be very descriptive. Uh, and literal, like here we have your flower series where you actually count out your 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 um, stems and petals. <laughs> um, and then the other ones, which ha are more hinting at the narrative, I was curious, you know, how do you choose which way to go um, with with your titles or anything you would like to share about about that decision making process? Yeah. You know, that's actually a really good question. I don't think I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. With these um, that, you know, literally say these are flowers and this is, these are the parts of flowers, I guess. Um, I think for me, these felt more like objects. I think that the petals still feel like they have some character to them, but um, it feels more like the flower is the character as opposed to the individual petals being the characters. Whereas in the other ones, it's the individual pieces that are the characters. And so I think that with some of these that are very literal, um, it was just addressing the one or two characters that were there and just naming what it was. With the other ones, they all feel like they have individual personalities. And so then mm. it becomes less about the character and more about the relationship or the action and what's happening. So I guess to me, that's the, that's, yeah, like some of these other ones, they just feel, um, uh, I guess more abstract. They're not rooted in anything specific. And mm -hmm. so it's more about their relationship and their actions. Uh, I guess they feel more active to me there than say the flowers do. Yeah. <laughs> And even well, and this cases, one is sort of like, in between. <laughs> right. Well, and I was thinking in, in cases like this where, um, you know, it is the title is the clue to what it is. Um, because otherwise, maybe you wouldn't assume grapefruit uh, on, you know, in the left hand panel. Mm -hmm. But I think that the title gives a context that goes, oh, OK, I, I see that. That's not necessarily what I thought when I first walked up but mm -hmm. that makes sense to me. And so some of them are, are literal clues to what's going on. Um, yeah. and, and hopefully what it does is, um, is a, I hope that it's a surprise um, that when you see it across the gallery and you see just a bunch of blue dots, you aren't expecting anything in particular. And then when you walk up and it's blueberries, it goes, oh, okay. Get yeah. It. Um, <laughs> and that's sort of what, where some of the titles come from. Um, mm -hmm. They're just little clues. Yeah, and um, in a way, it makes uh, it's not just an abstract painting, you know, of, of shapes, and it, it makes a story or 
lends itself to a story then. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's really what all of these are about. It's all about relationships, a narrative, um, an experience. All of these pieces are meant to be sort of their own experience. So what are some of the major influences on your work right now? That's like, mm. that's where you came from, you know, with in the sort of being nurtured in the print shop, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but like now, mm -hmm. now um, in your studio and the work that you're making, um, what, what are your influences? <laughs> You know, I mean, I have all of my, you know, I have all the big artists, right? We all have the artists that are our go-tos. And I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a big, um, I'm always in awe of some of these minimalist artists because, uh, because what they're doing is sort of, it's what I'm trying to do, which is tell a story with the fewest elements possible. Mm -hmm. You know, what can you do with a line? What can you do with a shape or color? And can you can you present an entire story, a whole relationship with just those base elements? And so I have, you know, I have the long list of minimalist artists who I have followed for all of my career. You know, yeah. um, Mylan, <laughs> Agnes Martin, uh, mm. Sophie Tober, are all all of those people who I go back to again and again and again, and just you know. And of course, we have the Cleveland Museum of Art here, which is just a, a gem. And so I go and sit down in front of their pieces sometimes. Um, but for day-to-day -day inspiration, I have a number of young, newer artists that I follow on Instagram who are just doing really cool work. And, you know, for all of my complaint about social media, and I do have many, um, <laughs> there are some really great things about it. And one is access to all of these artists, because I do get a little taste of that community piece from being in the print shop because mm -hmm. artists are putting up on their social media, their processes. So you can see how they're constructing their work, where they're pulling inspiration from, um, they're just all of the process that's going on behind the scenes that we aren't really privy to outside mm -hmm. of a shared working space. Otherwise you really don't know what's going on behind the scenes under the canvas for other artists. And so I, I follow a lot of artists on Instagram and check in and see what they're doing. And it is, it's fascinating and inspiring and intimidating. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a wonderful way to learn and to to find new materials and and things like that. So there's this one artist I'm completely obsessed with, and I won't I can't think of her name. She's young, she's Italian, but she does these these really large canvas pieces. Um, they're all black and white, and it's just this tiny, tiny, tiny detailed repetitive work. And she's doing something that's very different from my work, but it's similar in that she's using just these repeating shapes and elements to build a larger piece. And it is just, it's work I've never seen anyone else do. And being able to see that and to have access to that is fantastic. I don't know how else I would have found her or some of these other artists that I'm watching right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I have to remind myself that when I'm railing against meta and all those other things because I really, <laughs> I really hate that stuff uh -huh. um, but I am really grateful to be able to get inspiration from these other artists because there's just really really cool stuff going on out there um, and it can it can get uh, those other things can get missed when you're just working alone in your studio all the time and so having that is really, really helpful, but there's a lot of cool artists out there doing cool things. Yeah. Oh, I, I know. I definitely can get sucked into the, the scrolling through because I typically only follow um, visual artists on Instagram. Yes. So it's like, okay, <laughs> there's yeah. so much. Great. Yeah, that is that is definitely the uh, one of the bonuses of, of having that available. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this has been really awesome. Thank you so much yes. for giving us a peek into your practice and um, process. And this is really, really great to learn more about your work. <laughs> well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and for the show. It really is, it is gorgeous. 
I love the way that it came out. You have such a nice space and you guys oh. just did a really beautiful job curating and hanging it. So I uh, thank you for that. And thank you for taking the time to talk to me this morning. You're welcome. Again, I just want to say thank you to Kate for taking time out of her day to chat with me. I really, really enjoy hearing about uh, these playful paintings. They're so great. Um, and thank you all of you for listening and paying it and watching. Uh, I hope to see you again soon.